Who were the Gibeonites, and what led the people who helped Joshua conquer Canaan to demand blood revenge from David? And how one biblical mother's most fascinating story is related to Gibeonites' blood revenge. Have you ever heard the harrowing story of Rizpah protecting the bodies of her dead sons? It's a tale of love and loss, set against the backdrop of political turmoil in ancient Israel. The story begins with Joshua leading the Israelites into the Promised Land after their exodus from Egypt. The Gibeonites were a local Canaanite people who tricked Joshua into making a treaty with them. As foreigners, the Gibeonites became servants in Israelite society. Generations later, King Saul breaks this ancient treaty and kills a number of Gibeonites. After Saul's death, the Gibeonite leaders demand retribution from David for this past violence. Seeking to resolve the conflict, David surrenders seven of Saul's sons and grandsons to the Gibeonites, who then hang them on a mountain. Two of the sons was Rizpah's son. For months, the grieving Rizpah keeps guard over the bodies, protecting them from scavengers. Eventually, David gathers the bones of Jonathan and Saul for proper burial because of her resilient act of mourning and protest. The story reveals the far-reaching consequences of political decisions and how ordinary people can get caught in the middle. To understand it fully, we'll look at the historical context and main characters involved in this iconic, but rarely discussed, biblical tale. The story of Rizpah begins generations before her son's deaths, when the Israelites first entered Canaan after forty years in the desert. As Joshua led the people into the Promised Land, the city of Gibeon faced a difficult decision. Their neighbors were being vanquished, but they feared facing a similar fate. As the Bible recounts in Joshua 9 verses 3-4. However, when the people of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, they resorted to a ruse, they went as a delegation whose donkeys were loaded with worn-out sacks and old wineskins, cracked and mended. So the Gibeonites devised a clever deception, dressing themselves in worn clothes and moldy bread to make it look as if they had come from afar. Tricked by their ruse, Joshua made a covenant with the Gibeonites to spare them. When the truth emerged, he upheld his word, but made them woodcutters and water carriers rather than killing them for their deceit. This covenant would shape Gibeonite relations with Israelites for years to come. Though initially spared, the Gibeonites became servants and occupied one of the lowest rungs of Israelite society. Gibeonites remembered the deception that led to their subordinate status, while Israelites viewed them as foreigners who should consider themselves fortunate just to be alive. While the conflict wasn't fully resolved until the time of Rizpah and King David, its roots go back to Joshua's covenant with the Gibeonites. It was his oath that created a cycle of retribution that led to Rizpah's son's deaths during Saul's reign. After the Gibeonites made peace with Joshua and the Israelites, neighboring kings banded together in fear. As Joshua 10 verses 3 to 4 recounts. So Adoni Zedek king of Jerusalem appealed to Hoam king of Hebron, Piram king of Jarmuth, Japhia king of Lachish and Debir king of Eglon. Come up and help me attack Gibeon, he said, because it has made peace with Joshua and the Israelites. These Amorite kings laid siege to Gibeon in retaliation for their treaty. The Gibeonites appealed to Joshua for help. Coming to their defense, Joshua 10 verse 10 says. The Lord threw them into confusion before Israel. So Joshua and the Israelites defeated them completely at Gibeon. Israel pursued them along the road going up to Beth Horon and cut them down all the way to Azekah and Makeda. God rained down hailstones from above as the Amorites fled their route, inflicting more casualties than Joshua's sword. While not the direct cause of the later conflict between Saul and the Gibeonites, this episode sheds light on the hostility they faced for their alliance. Surrounded by enemies, the treaty with Joshua was a matter of survival. Saul's act of betrayal hundreds of years later carries bitter echoes of the past, 
fueling the Gibeonites' rage and desire for justice after so long. In a bid to consolidate his power, Saul violated the ancient treaty and massacred Gibeonites' communities. Saul's violation of the ancient covenant with the Gibeonites was the direct cause of the famine that followed David's reign. As 2 Samuel 21 verse 1 recounts, During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years, so David sought the face of the Lord. The Lord said, It is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house, it is because he put the Gibeonites to death. God brought the famine upon the land to punish Saul's actions against the Gibeonites. Seeking relief from the famine, David negotiated with Gibeonite leaders. As stated in 2 Samuel 21 verses 3-4, David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And how shall I make atonement, that you may bless the heritage of the Lord? The Gibeonites said to him, It is not a matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house, neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. At first David offered monetary compensation, but the Gibeonites insisted that only the blood of Saul's family could pay for his crime against them. In their minds, only Saul's execution could avenge the decades of resentment resulting from his violation of Joshua's commitment. Seeking to end the famine, David surrenders seven of Saul's descendants to the Gibeonites for execution, as described in 2 Samuel 21 verses 8-9. But the king took Armani and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Aya's daughter Rizpah, whom she had borne to Saul, together with the five sons of Saul's daughter Merab, whom she had borne to Adriel son of Barzillai the Mahalathite. He handed them over to the Gibeonites, who killed them and exposed their bodies on a hill before the Lord. All seven of them fell together, they were put to death during the first days of the harvest, just as the barley harvest was beginning. Rizpah, the mother of two of Saul's sons, had her children sacrificed to appease the Gibeonites. After the brutal executions, Rizpah kept guard over the bodies on the mountain, protecting them from scavengers, as seen in 2 Samuel 21 verse 10. Rizpah daughter of Aya took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest till the rain poured down from the heavens on the bodies, she did not let the birds touch them by day or the wild animals by night. Rizpah's protest compelled David to finally bury Saul's body, restoring justice. As 2 Samuel 21 verse 14 states, They buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish, at Zela in Benjamin, and did everything the king commanded. After that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land. When David heard of Rizpah's act, he brought her husband Saul's and Jonathan's bodies across the Jordan, where they were buried along with the seven condemned men in the Kish family grave. As the sovereign, David had the authority to demand the bodies from the Gibeonites, so the narrative shows that David shows respect for the dead and cares for his widow. Her resilient act of protest led David to give Saul and Jonathan an honorable burial finally. Rizpah's courage convinced David to correct his mistake, granting her sons and Saul's lineage proper funeral rites. Through her steadfast mourning, Rizpah transformed meaningless tragedy into a noble stand for decency. In rising up against passive female expectations to instead spark royal action, Rispa emerges from obscurity into enduring legend. Her courage pioneered the power of nonviolent resistance against state abuses of power. The complacency of nations can be shaken by one woman's principled act. Only then, after justice was served through proper burial, did God lift the famine from the land. And so ends this epic story that spanned generations, ignited from a desperate treaty made between Joshua and the Gibeonites seeking to survive conquest. Through Saul's later betrayal of that vow and Rizpah's persistent protest in holding kings accountable, we witness the far-reaching impact of leadership decisions upon ordinary citizens caught in the crossfire.
In exploring the many facets of the Gibeonite massacre, from political expediency to one mother's impassioned stand, we surface challenging questions about the moral use of power and the echoes of historical wounds through the centuries. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, share it with fellow history enthusiasts, and subscribe for more content. Remember to hit the notification bell to stay updated. With that said, thanks for watching and until next time.